morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Found in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen. Let's pray together, church. Father, we thank you for this new covenant, a covenant of grace, of repentance and forgiveness. Father, as we embark into your word this morning, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We do make the confession that this is the holy word of God, that what we are about to read is flawless and perfect. It was breathed out by you and written for our benefit so that we might know you accurately, not by mere myth or legend, but we would know you in truth, we would know you in understanding, we would know you in the Spirit. So Father, now we ask that you would give us understanding as we open your word. We set this time apart as sacred and holy, for we, are about to read your flawless word. Speak to our hearts now, we ask. In Jesus' name and wherever you are, you can agree by saying amen and amen. We are in the midst of a series right now in the church, and we're entitling it The Foundations of Our Faith. We've gone through many foundations of our faith, from prayer to worship and Holy Communion and water baptism, all pillars of our understanding of Scripture and our understanding of how we are to honor God. How are we supposed to live out our Christian faith? How are we supposed to gather as a church family what are we supposed to do? What are the characteristics that we should have that separate us from those that do not walk with God to those of us that do call Him our Lord and Savior? What are those foundational truths that we should know if we call ourselves children of God? Well, the elders of this church brought up one particular uh, foundational piece that they really wanted uh, taught on and discussed. And after we discuss this, after we go over this on the Sunday morning that this is taught, the church as a whole will partake in Holy Communion. And the topic they want us to discuss is law and grace. And the reason why we are to discuss this and why we should celebrate Holy Communion following this understanding is connected to the understanding, the proper understanding of law and grace. And we will celebrate Holy Communion. If you're listening to this recording in your home, we can still learn 
the, the difference between law and grace and the similarities between the two. And then in your home, I, in this time together, will do my very best to help you prepare your heart as we would if we were gathered together for Holy Communion. So as we embark into that, where do we look in Scripture to really comprehend law and grace? Where do we go? Because a lot of us might think that the law is the Old Testament of the Bible and that grace is found in the New Testament of your Bible. And there is some truth to that. We can see some uh, foundational pieces of that understanding in that there was the law given in the Old Testament and we see grace abound in the New Testament. But the first controversial thing that I'd like us to go over is the idea that law and grace are not opposites. And that there is grace in the Old Testament and that God's law is in the New Testament as well. So that it's not that there was law and that there is now grace, it's that there has always been the grace of God and we are still following the law of God. But let's make sure that we understand very clearly in our minds what he means by his law and what he wants us to understand about his grace. So first thing we want to make note of is often we refer to the law of God as all the commandments that were given of God. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that most of the law that is referred to here is the law of Moses. And the law of Moses was uh, given by God through Moses for the people of Israel, his chosen people. If you remember, just like the scripture we just read out of Hebrews 8, God called and rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them out of slavery across the Red Sea. That was the rescue mission. And then he gave them his law. He gave his chosen people ten commandments. Remember, the ten commandments were written in the penmanship of God himself. He wrote them. That was God's law for his people. But then God gave laws through Moses for the people of Israel. We see all sorts of different laws given to those particular chosen people in that season, a covenant given to them. Uh, there were laws about how to live out your life, how to worship God in a very specific way. They even had laws about their hygiene how to wash themselves. A lot of this was given for their own protection. Did you know that there were laws given to the people of Israel even about skin diseases and diseases that were tossed through the air like what we're dealing with today? Actually, one of their particular commands was if you had a certain skin problem that you had to go outside the city area until you were healed. It seems extreme in the time, and you can imagine how some of them wanted to not follow this law. But what they didn't know is that if this skin disease got in contact with anyone else, that disease would have spread through all two million Israelites and would have wiped them off the face of the earth. They didn't know that. So God gave them a law that said, look, if you get this skin disease, go outside the city, wait till it heals, and then come back into the city. And they were saved by following the law of God given through Moses. We call it the Mosaic Law of God. It was for that time and that season. God even gave them a covenant. These are my chosen people. Follow 
my covenant that I set out for you. But we also have the Ten Commandments given by God for the people. Remember, that was written not through Moses. But the Ten Commandments were given by God, written down on tablets with God's penmanship for the people. And those Ten Commandments stand true for us today. We know this for multiple different reasons. One of the largest is simply this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So do the Ten Commandments apply to us today to love God and to love our neighbor? Absolutely. Can we accomplish the Ten Commandments by our own strength? Absolutely not. So as we look into this idea of law and grace, let's make sure that we understand what law we're talking about and what grace really is. If God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he didn't become gracious in the New Testament and was ungracious in the Old Testament. And he wouldn't have given us rules and laws to follow in the Old Testament and then said, we have no laws and no rules and can do whatever we want in the New Testament. He has always given us, this is what you are to do, and this is what you should stay away from. And I want to point out that those were always for our benefit. Think of it this way. I give rules to my children because I love my children. I want them to be safe and protected. So there are rules that I set out for them not to follow. Don't play close to the road. Go to bed at this time so that you get a full night's sleep. Eat these foods, for they're healthy for you to grow strong. These rules do not apply to the neighbor kids across the street. They are not my children. And those parents will set rules for those children. See. When God gives us rules and laws to follow, they are for our benefit, not just so we know what not to do. It might not seem like it is for their benefit to eat their vegetables at the dinner table, but it is for their benefit. And I know, and their mother knows, that this is good for them and they will grow healthy if they eat their vegetables. Remember, God giving us rules, God giving us laws, is because he loves us. Let's go back all the way to the beginning of our Bible when God created Adam and Eve and he gave them a command. Don't eat the fruit from this tree. They did what they were told not to do. So. The reason he told them not to do that is it wouldn't be good for them. But was God's grace in the Garden of Eden? Of course it was. Because think of it this way. God did not destroy them. He simply had to create distance between them. Adam and Eve's disobedience resulted in distance, not death. That was the grace of God. When God came down in the cool of the day and saw that Adam and Eve had done what they were told not to do, instead of destroying them, he killed an animal, the first sacrifice ever given, and clothed them with its skin so that they were not embarrassed by their nakedness. He had mercy on them, but he could no longer be in contact with them, for he was holy and perfect, and they had now allowed sin into their life. Now there was distance, but not 
death. The only death that occurred in the Garden of Eden was the animal that gave its life and the blood was shed for Adam and Eve to be covered. Do you see how God's grace has been poured out through all of the Old Testament? And that in the New Testament, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. We still have these commands of God that we are to live out today. So let's go to scripture and see where we can find this explained to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. Romans chapter 8. Let's begin on verse 1. Romans chapter 8, beginning on verse 1, reads, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to to the Spirit. Amen for that passage. Let's take that verse apart and see what we can learn from Romans chapter 8. To really understand Romans 8, we need to read through Romans 7. Now, I want to remind you that your Bible was not originally written with chapters and verses. Those were added later simply for referencing different areas in Scripture. Can you imagine having uh, your Holy Bible in front of you and someone saying it's somewhere in Isaiah, about the middle? It'd be very hard for you to find a text without having chapters and verses. But we don't want to get locked into reading our Bible only with chapters and verses, for it won't make sense that way. It wasn't designed that way. It's simply for referencing Scripture to use our chapters and verses. To really understand Scripture, make sure you read the full context of wherever you are in your Bible. The reason we need to go back to Romans 7, and we're not going to read the whole thing, simply we don't have the time, but you can do this in your home. In Romans 7, you see how Paul is clearly stating how he could not measure up to the requirements of the law. What I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do, and I'm, I'm perilous under the law. It seems impossible because my flesh is so weak, I can't live up to the requirements of the law. And if we were to live under that condemnation of not being able to measure up to the law of God, it would feel weighty to be a Christian. When something that seems and is impossible is put as our measuring stick, and we would feel the weight of not being able to live up to what God has set before us. So when we read through chapter 7 and see how Paul says, the law I just cannot seem to keep. I try and I see it in front of me. And then he begins in chapter 8 by saying, there is therefore no condemnation. How can he say that he, there is no condemnation if coming out of chapter 7, he says, I am having the most difficult time living under the law of God. He says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean exactly? How can we go from Understanding that the law of God, those Ten Commandments passed down to us, still apply today, yet we say it is very difficult to love our neighbor. 
It is very difficult to not think certain ways. And yet we don't feel condemned. You have to apply that we are in Christ Jesus. That's the only way that we can understand why we are not condemned. We find this answered in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, He himself, that is Jesus, He himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He bore our sins. He paid for all that we will ever do that is against the law of God. See, this is where we understand Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Our living in a no condemnation understanding, we are not feeling condemned that we don't follow the law of God to the letter, is that we are following the one who did follow the law to the letter. Remember, he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law. I've not come to abolish. I came to fulfill it. Jesus lived out a perfect life and then gave his life as the sacrifice for us. See, this is why we need to understand we need to be with him in Him, in Jesus. Remember this scripture, John 14, 6, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need Christ's atoning sacrifice on us for us to be able to have no condemnation. In other words, picture this. It is beyond what we can afford for us to get into where we need to get into. But there's only one that actually has the ticket to get in. And so when we come up to the gate and we recognize we can't afford a ticket to get in to where we want to be, and one that does have a ticket says, he's with me. He's my plus one. He can come in with me. See, the only way that we can get in to where we can't buy the ticket to get in is if we are with Christ. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So let's go back up to where we started, where it says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. For sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. All right, that is a little complicated. Let's break this apart. The old law, both the Mosaic law, the law given for the people of Israel through the person of Moses from God, but also the Ten Commandments, the law of God. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. The covenant that God made with his people, the chosen people, 
If they had followed their uh, rules, that, that covenant that God made with them, then we wouldn't need a second covenant. God made a covenant with his chosen people, and they broke the covenant. That's why Hebrews says, look, if the first covenant, if you had followed that, we wouldn't need another one. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. If Adam and Eve had not been tempted and had not fallen to the serpent's temptation, there wouldn't have been a distance between them and God. But they did fall short of what God told them to do. Don't eat of this tree. And they did. If they didn't, there wouldn't have been a distance. This is the cause and effect. So there was a covenant made for the people of Israel. This is for your good and for your safety. And they did not keep their end of the covenant. God kept his end of the covenant and did not, they did not keep their end of the covenant. One particular theologian put it this way, that when it says that the covenant of God, the Ten Commandments, when they were written on two tablets of stone, he said, this is not because God couldn't fit the Ten Commandments on one tablet of stone, it's because there has to be two copies of any agreement made in the law. One for the recipient and one for the lawmaker. One of those was for God and one of those was for the people. This was a, a law that was passed. God says, I'll keep my law, I'll keep my end of things if you keep your end. If you do what I ask you to do, I will take care of you. If you do not, then you've separated yourself from me. God had one and we had the other. See, when we look back here, we see that we didn't keep the covenant. They did not keep the covenant. But this is where hope comes in. Do you remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Well, I want to read for you John 3.17 that says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let's go back up to Romans chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. God gave his law, and the people were weakened by their flesh. They could not keep it. They could not keep what God had asked them to do. So God sent his own son in the form of a man. And that man, that God, Jesus himself, he did keep the law all the way, every dot of the law until the end. And then he gave himself as the sacrifice. See, that's the last part of the Romans 8 that we want to look at. In order, this is verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. There was a righteous requirement in the law. You must live out the law perfectly and I will keep my end. God says he will keep his end if we do what we are asked to do. But we learn in verse 3 of Romans 8 that we were weakened by the flesh. We could not do what God had asked us to do. So instead of leaving us hopeless and unable to do what we've been asked to do, he gave us a savior, a rescuer. See, that's God's grace that he sent his son. But here's where I want you to understand that grace is not only in the New Testament when Jesus shows up. Remember that Jesus was the plan all along. All through the Old Testament, we see 
the, the prophets telling us that God will send us the Messiah to rescue us. Is God always been gracious? Well, if his son giving his life for us was the plan all the way from the Garden of Eden, then of course he's always been gracious to us. Do we still have his law with us today? Yes. Remember, it's not gone. It's just been fulfilled through Jesus. So how do we keep God's law? Well, we do our very best to walk out with self-control the law that God gave us. Those Ten Commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. But we can't do it. We are also weakened by the flesh. We're unable to do this on our own strength. And so, we're in Christ. See, if we understand how the, the covenant worked, I want to show you how this covenant works for a moment. Maybe this will help us understand why Jesus needed to come, why he needed to live a perfect life, both in thought and in his deeds. And then why did he have to die? Let's see if we can figure this out together. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. This is referring back to the old covenant, the first covenant. It says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20, if we were to read around this, we'd see that blood was sprinkled on all the different pieces that they used in the temple. And then Moses said this in verse 20 of Hebrews 9, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. So God said the only way that sin can be atoned for, covered, sin was covered, the only way that that can happen is with the shedding of blood. And the blood which symbolizes life covers over the wrongdoing. So where was that first initiated? Well, let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, they, they did what they were told not to do. God said, don't, and they did. And so there was blood that was shed, and that blood covered over the sin that Adam and Eve consciously did. That was the beginning. Some call that the, the scarlet thread through all of Scripture. That was the very beginning. That sin is covered. But they were separated from God. For now there was sin in their mortal body. They dwelt in that. They had a sin nature. That's what you and I have. That's why it says we're born into that. Naturally, we tend to go and lean away from God, which is why we have to, Paul used the word, crucify our flesh to lean into the things of God. It's not natural for us to lean into the things of God. If we are left to our own natural devices, we will lean away from the things of God. So that's why one of the fruits of the Spirit was self Control. That's one we never want to talk about. But that's what he said we need to do. Like Paul said, remember, I do what I don't want to do, and what I want to do, I don't do. That is the, the leaning into God which takes effort. Work out your salvation is what Scripture says. So we understand now that it, it took blood to cover over sin. So when you 
did something that was against what God had told you to do. You had to go and get a sacrifice, bring it to the priest, and say, this is for my sin. I have done what I was told not to do, and I need to be covered so that God would forgive me. And you give your sacrifice to the priest. And then the priest would then take the blood of that sacrifice and would cover over, and it would be the covering, the atonement for your sins. Only the priest was allowed into that holy place to come before God and represent you before God. That's how that worked. But see, God recognized, I never desired the blood of goats and bulls, he said. That was never my intention. My intention was I wanted us to be in a relationship. I wanted you to be with me. But you separated yourself from me. And I am holy and I can't be around sin and you are constantly sinning. How can we be close to each other? You're going to constantly have to keep bringing sacrifices because you won't do and can't do what I've asked you to do. Do you see the dilemma that God is in and the frustration that we continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God? Blood needed to be shed for the covering of sin. We constantly kept sinning. So from the beginning, he knew we would walk away from him, yet he created us anyways. He knew we would hurt him, and yet he loved us anyways. He knew we would abandon him, and he stayed close to us anyways. He knew we would deny him. And he gave his life for you anyways. Christ's death on the cross was the plan all along. All through the Old Testament, it was prophesied that the Son of God would come and he would give a once for all sacrifice. He would fully follow the law in thought and in deed. And being perfect and flawless, he would then offer his life as a sacrifice for us. He said, a once for all time sacrifice. Isaiah 53, <coughs> verse 5 and 6 says that he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities, what we had done wrong. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we were healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, God the Father hated sin. And he said that his wrath would come on sin. And he would crush sin. He would destroy sin. He hates sin. 
But we just kept sinning. And he says, I love you so much, I don't want to crush you. But you won't stop. You keep doing what I tell you not to do. I gave you my law, and you will not follow it. And, and he said, but my wrath, my anger, it, it, it's there against sin. And so when his son came to save all of us, his son did not sin in any way. And that's why when Jesus was hanging on that cross, on that hillside, right outside the city gates, it says that all the sin was put on one man, Not just all the sin of that moment. Understand that all sin for all time was placed on the shoulders of one perfect, guiltless man. And God the Father crushed him. His only son that he loved so much, he crushed him for all sin laid on the shoulders of your Messiah. And instead of crushing you and instead of crushing me, he crushed his own son so that you and I could be forgiven. And he died on that cross. Eloi, Eloi, Lenai Nabachnii, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For God the Father had turned away from his own son, for his son bore the sin of the world. For you and for me. Remember, God's grace did not show up in the New Testament. God had been gracious with us from the beginning of time. And God's law didn't end at the beginning of the New Testament, for it is still with us today. It's that what changed is that it was fulfilled on the cross of Calvary. It was paid for in that moment. This is why Jesus, several nights before the tragic night of his death and payment for your sin, he said this, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Do you remember how Moses said, that this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you, the blood of goats and lambs. That was the covenant that was used to cover over sin. But recognize that now sin was no longer covered for, it was paid for. Now sin is gone. Sin is gone, it's paid for, it's over. So when you fall short and you don't, measure to the yardstick that God has put out before you and you say, I, I did it again. I did what you asked me not to do. But I am in your son and your son's blood covers me. And so you are forgiven. God's always been gracious and the law of God still stands today. But now we're covered in the blood of Christ. So when you stand before God at the end of days, when you stand before the judgment seat of God, you will not hear a record of all the things that you have done wrong. That's what we tend to think when we stand before God and he's gone this great throne 
and he calls you forward before him and you timidly walk forward knowing he's going to list out all the things that you have done wrong and how you do not deserve and what you're going to hear if you know Christ as your Savior, you will hear that there is therefore now no condemnation. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you will receive your reward that you don't deserve because the Lamb of God was slain as a sacrifice on your behalf. That's law and grace combined in Jesus Christ. I hope that you can understand now the the priority of Holy Communion. I hope that you now understand why we say to do this in remembrance of Him. We can't forget what He did for us. He gave His life for us because we could not do the righteous requirements of the law. And so he fulfilled the law for you and for me. So that when I stand before God, I will know I am imperfect. He will know that I am imperfect. But I will say, I know your son And I accept his gift of grace and his blood on my life. And though I am imperfect, I will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You will hear the same if you are in Christ. Remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ Jesus. When Paul was telling the church how to come to the holy table of Holy Communion, he gave them very detailed instructions, and I want to share those with you now so that you can prepare your heart as you would if you were here in the halls of the church. Remember, Christ is with you wherever you are right this moment. Christ does not dwell only in man-made structures. Christ is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you right now, lives within you. So I want to share with you Paul's instructions for purification of our heart in our mind and our spirit. This is the instruction for Holy Communion. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself.
Those are the instructions given by the Apostle Paul for Holy Communion. What I'd like to share with you now before we close is simply this. If you feel called of God to share in Holy Communion in your home, whether by yourself or with your family members, my direction for you would be this. Do not at all take that lightly. It is a holy thing to share in Holy Communion. It is also a very dangerous thing to share Holy Communion. You literally could eat and drink judgment on yourself. But if you feel called and are unable to come to the house of the Lord where we together will partake of Holy Communion, if you're unable to be here, I understand. And there is no guilt from me to you if you cannot be here. I want you to be safe. I want you to be safe physically. If you can't be here and gather together, then please be safe. I also want you to be safe spiritually. So this is why I give you the instructions that were given to me on how to approach the holy table of the Lord. If you feel called to share in this holy meal in your home, please do so with the greatest and highest reverence that you can. Find bread. Find the fruit of the vine in your home. Not enough to fill your stomach, for Paul said this is not a meal to satisfy our body. This is to be done in remembrance. So a small portion of each whether you receive by yourself or with your family, first pass out the bread and read 1 Corinthians 11.23. This is my body, which is for you. And do this in remembrance of me. And then with all that you can, make sure that your heart is clean before the Lord. Repent before you Partake of those elements. Father, forgive me and create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. And then while you are focused on God, partake of that bread together. And then after that, take a very small portion of the fruit of the vine. And if there are others with you, give some to them. And then read, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And while you prepare your heart to receive this, think there was an old covenant where we had to follow these very detailed rules for our benefit. But now we are under a new covenant where his blood has covered. Think of the covenant changing and then partake of that drink. When you finish receiving bread together and receiving the fruit of the vine together, close in a word of prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving, that law did not end and grace begin, but grace has always been, and the law is here for our benefit, to show us what is sin and what is righteousness. 
Let us now together close this time in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is accurate and flawless, and it helps us to understand why you have given us instruction, why you have given us your law, that it is for our benefit, and it shows us what we are to do and what we are to stay away from. We recognize that we are imperfect. We recognize that we do not have strength in our own selves to follow your law perfectly. So we thank you for the gift of your Son. We now say we are in Christ. We will live out our lives in Christ. But we thank you today for the hope that when we stand before you, whenever that day is, we will not hear a list of what we have done wrong. We will hear what we do not deserve to hear, which is well done my good and faithful servant. Until that day, we will do all that we can to follow the law that you have given to us with the strength of your Holy Spirit giving us the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the strength to do what we should do and to stay away from what we should not participate with. We thank you for the hope that is in Christ. And now as we close our time together, we pray as one large family. Wherever we are gathered, we are united in prayer as we close our time by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all until we meet again.